Just mentioned that we are, um, Keith has been interviewing and showing the building to contractors the past week or so here. We're in the process of getting bids and pricing to blow out the wall and fix things better. Um, so we'll have a little more space, a little more room and a little more convenient layout. Um, so keep in, in charge of that. So if you don't like it when it's all done, it's the man back there in the back is responsible for it. All right. So, uh, so we're working on that and hopefully this winter we'll have things torn up and then put back together and, uh, things will look good. So, all right. Ephesians chapter nine, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, <clears throat> According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, then the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Let's bow our hearts down in a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity we have this morning of looking at your word and studying it together. And as we do so, now we pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ, be edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, as you know, we've been studying the past several weeks about the will of God and how to find the will of God. We're trying to answer some questions. We kind of go over these each Sunday morning. I know some of you have seen them several times, but some of you maybe haven't seen them yet. So at the end of this series of studies, hopefully we will have answered these questions. Number one, is God in control? Is he in control of what's going on? Does he, does everything that happens happen because he ordained it to be so? Number two, what is God's will for my life? If he's in control uh, and in control of my life, then how do I know what I want, what he wants me to do? And as you follow that up with, is his will for my life different than his will for the lives of others? In other words, does he have an individual will for Donna and for Tracy and for Dell and for Galen and for Verla? Or does he have a will for the body of Christ? And all of us find our place in that will. So that's a question we're looking at in this series of studies. Regardless if that will is a corporate will for the body of Christ or individual, how do we find that will? How do we know what it is? <clears throat> Does he supernaturally intervene to accomplish that will? This series kind of all started when uh, they, they tried to assassinate uh, Donald Trump, and you know he he turned his head at just the right moment, and the, you know we all know what happened. The bullet didn't hit him and hit his ear and all that kind of stuff. So that kind of started this. Is that and everybody you have everybody saying, well, that was a miracle. That must have been God's protection and all that. So um, does he intervene? If it was his not his will that Donald Trump be killed that day, did he intervene to make sure he turned his head at just the right time so that bullet would miss? Or did he make the guy a bad shot or whatever? Um, does God intervene to punish and reward? That's a part of understanding his will. If you're walking, it, can you determine by the circumstances around you whether or not you're in God's will? Read about Israel in the Old Testament. If you're in my will, I'll be blessing you. If you're not in my will, I'll be cursing you. So you always know, based on what's going on around you, if you're in God's will or not. Um, many preachers today preach that. <clears throat> if you're in God's will and if you're serving him, <clears throat> you'll be healthy, you'll have lots of money, everything will be good, your relationships will be good, everything will be great. Um, yet, you read about Paul's ministry and you read that wasn't the case in his life, even though he clearly was serving the Lord. Thus far, we've talked about <clears throat> the Scripture teaching. So let's go over to Romans chapter 8. The Scripture teaches that what happens in this world is vain, without meaning, and without purpose. So Romans chapter 8, for example, uh, look at verse uh, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature, <clears throat> that's all of us, all of creation, but by reason of him that subjected the same in hope. Creature was made subject to vanity. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about what that means. Vanity is meaninglessness and purposelessness. The things that happen to us and the things that we accomplish in this life, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes yeah. chapter yeah. 1, that all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is full. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, saith the preacher. Um, no matter what we accomplish, no matter what we think we've done, in the end, it's just all vanity. Yet the scripture also says, further down in verse 28, that all things work together for good <clears throat> to them that love God, to them are the call according to his purpose. So in one case, the scripture says, 
all is vanity. It is meaninglessness. It is purposelessness. There is no purpose. In another instance, it says, all things work together for good to them who love God, to them are the called according to his purpose. So how can it be that everything that happens is vanity, and yet all things work together for good for God's purpose? How can it be that man's existence is one without meaning or purpose, and yet Paul says everything that happens in your life is working for God's purpose? So how, how can you reconcile those two things? Well, as we've seen coming up to this point, that the the answer to that, the question, the, the question we have to ask is, what things are all things in Romans chapter 8, verse 28? Romans 8, 28 says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them are the called according to his purpose. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, the statement that Paul makes, which is sort of a parallel statement, <laughs> is even stronger than that. Like, is it God's will that I have this fraud living in my throat this morning that just won't get um, So Ephesians 1.11, in whom also, that's in Christ, in Christ, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, having, uh, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, that's an even, even stronger statement. In Romans 8, he says, all things work together for good. So, you know, the way people sort of try to read that sometimes, because, of course, a Calvinist reads it and says, yeah, he's, he's orchestrating it all. He's determining what's going to happen. But what most people, because they don't want to be Calvinist, they say, well, that just means that, at, you know, everything that happens is God's will, and it sort of just magically somehow works out for his purpose. But Ephesians 1 makes a, even a more positive statement about it when it says, he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. It's not just that, well, everything's going to work out. It is that he is working everything out after the counsel of his own will. So that's a very a po uh, affirmative, positive statement about that God is doing something. So we started to try to understand what things are all things. And if you go back to, we're just going to get a couple. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and maybe add one in that I just had a brainstorm about this week. And when you, sometimes when you have a brainstorm and then you tell people about your stormy brain, it's not good. But um, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 27, Paul says this, for he hath put, well, if you start, uh, start up at verse uh, 24, then cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, this is Christ, has delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his, uh, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subjected to him, then shall the Son also be subject to him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So Paul goes through this discussion about the, the Father putting all things under the feet of the Son, but then he says, oh, by the way, the Father isn't included in all things. That's what he says in verse 27, for he hath put all things under his feet, if all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. So when he says he put all things under him, does all things really mean everything or everyone or every being? It doesn't. It means everyone in the context of the passage, everyone except the one that put those things under him. So all things doesn't necessarily mean everything without exclusion. It's oftentimes modified by what's in the passage, the all things in the passage. Um, uh, I don't want to um, go to Philippians for a minute. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. There's, there's, we looked at several of these. and I don't want to look at all of them again this morning. Um, Philippians 2.14. Philippians 2.14. Do all things without murmuring and disputings. Does God want you to sin without murmuring and disputing? Is sin a thing? So does he want you to do all things without murmuring and disputing, including sin without murmuring and disputing? Clearly he doesn't. 
So what are the all things? The all things in verse 13, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So the things that are, are God's good pleasure that you're doing, do all those things without murmuring and disputing. It doesn't mean everything without exclusion. It means everything in the context of what Paul's saying here. Um, so, so that's the kind of thing we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Um, Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> I wanted to look at this just again briefly because last week we had technical difficulties and I, we found out the reason my thing wouldn't work last week is because there was pocket lint in my thumb drive, he told me. Pocket lint. So this high-tech thing is defeated by pocket lint. That's kind of like your rocket ship didn't go because a mouse chewed the wiring or something. You know, it's like, wait a minute, I got this big thing, and that little thing stopped it from going. So uh, Colossians 1 is another place <clears throat> in verse number uh, 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, where they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things are created by him and for him. He's before all things. By him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all all things to himself. By him, I, I say, where they be things in earth or things in heaven. Um, so he's talking there about reconciling, and he's reconciling all things. But what are the all things? Well, in verse uh, 16, they are, they are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. He's talking about positions of authority. And those positions of authority are going to be reconciled under the authority of Christ. And, and to do, we looked at these definitions. To reconcile is to conciliate anew, to call back to union and friendship the affections which have been alienated, to restore to friendship. <clears throat> so if a husband and a wife are separated and then they get reconciled, they've been called back to fellowship. But there's another meaning of reconciliation, that is to bring to acquiescence, content or quiet submission as to reconcile oneself to afflictions. So what does acquiescence mean? Well, acquiescence is a quiet assent, a silent submission or submission with apparent content, distinguished from avowed consent on the one hand. So avowed consent is when I willingly consent the authority of Christ. That's a vow, I vow a vow. I have, on the other hand, opposition or open discontent. On the other hand is I, I rebel against that authority. So when we acquiesce, and, and, and you know, I don't know why I didn't think of this, but William had the best example of it last week. So what is when we acquiesce to authority? <clears throat> when Galen used the example this morning of violating the law, and he goes 72 instead of 65. Now, the guy sitting next to you, Galen, goes 82 instead of 65, just, just so you know. Um, so, so he goes seven. So what is Galen not doing there? He's not acquiescing to the law. He is in opposition or open discontent of that law, right? So he's not acquiescing. He's certainly not agreeing to it. And, and he's not con consenting to it even, acquiescing to it. He's an open violation of it. But if he goes 65, even though he doesn't like it, then what's he doing? He's acquiescing. So principalities and powers in heavenly places, they do not all willingly consent to the lordship of Christ. But we know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, either by faith or by sight. And so all things in heaven and earth are reconciled unto him. And William had the perfect illustration of this last week when he's going out the door. You know, you've got to, sometimes you have to acquiesce and consent to the authority over you, even if you don't like it. He said, are you getting us ready for the election on next Tuesday? That you have to acquiesce and consent to the authority. And I thought, that's the perfect illustration. Well, I should have used that in my message, that... It doesn't matter who wins. Half the country is going to acquiesce to somebody that they don't like, right? 
because half the country is Trump, half the country is Harris, and half the country is going to have to acquiesce and just reconcile themselves to the fact, well, this is the way it is. So, so that's just, you know, the discussion we had about all things and how we understand all things. And one other one, go to 1 Timothy. Um, I was looking through stuff yesterday for today, and then um, there was a discussion going on with Keith and Dan and Bob on, on texting. And, uh, and this passage, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, and intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. What's the all men in verse 1? The all, I believe, all men in verse 1, uh, suppl uh, supplications... Colon, or semicolon. Now I'm going to explain all men for kings, for all that are in authority, that we create a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That all men, he's talking about praying for kings and those in authority, but he says all men. But now, verse 3 For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Who's that all men? Is it? I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure it is. He's talking about the ones in authority. What's, what are you supposed to pray for your, those in authority for? That they would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You're supposed to pray, I hope they have a good day. I hope you know, they do good in this negotiation with some foreign country. You're supposed to pray that they be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So if we had 537 saved, rightly dividing people in Washington, D.C., running the country, would it make a difference? I would think it would be a little bit of a difference. Hopefully it would make a difference. So, so the all men, and, and if you look at the context of 1 Timothy chapter 2, so he, he's going down these authority issues. Verse 1 through verse um, uh, 7 is the authority of, of government, kings and them in authority. Verse 8, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's the responsibility of men. In verse 9, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. That's the authority of, or that's the role of women. Down in verse 15, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. That's the children. So that passage, and then when you get into chapter 3, that Galen was talking about this morning, you get into chapter 3, now he's in authority in the local church. If a man desired the office of bishop, if a man desired the office of deacon. So 1 Timothy chapter 2 is about authority, government, man, woman, children. Chapter 3 is local church, bishops. Now, lest you go out and say, A.C. said, God doesn't want all men to be saved. All right, just... That's the context of that passage. But go to Colossians chapter 1, <clears throat> where we just were. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. The end of that chapter, after Paul deals with the authority in that chapter, then he gets down to verse, um, oh, verse 23, for example. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven where Paul made a minister. That's a more expansive, every creature under heaven. Eight, whom we preach, speak of Christ, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to the working which worketh in me mightily. So how many men does he want to warn and teach and present perfect in Christ Jesus. Every man. So there are verses where Paul says, every man. But I'm only saying that passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where he says, you know, supplication, prayers, giving of thanks for all men, then immediately says, for kings, for them in authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. If you want a life of godliness and honesty, you want your leaders to be saved and understand the truth. 
and that will give you a life of godliness and honesty. So that's just you know, another place where that all men is modified in the passage. So let's go back now to, to Romans. Whoops. Oh, well. <clears throat> Getting old. Let's go back to Romans chapter 8. And, and look at all things there. Because now we've, we've kind of seen, you know, that all things and all men, you know, sometimes those terms are modified by what's in the passage. So what does Paul say in Romans chapter 8, verse 28? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to whom are the called according to his purpose. And we know that the parallel passage to that in Ephesians chapter 1 says that God worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And we're going to kind of compare Romans 8 to Ephesians 1. Those, those two passages, beside Romans 8, 28 to 30, you should write down Ephesians chapter 1 because there's a lot of parallels there. So when he says, we know that all things work together for good. Ephesians 1, God worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Then in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, he says, for. So, how do we know what causes us to know that he works all things together after uh, for his per causes us to know that all things work together for good uh, to them that love God to them that are called according to his purpose for because whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So you notice he starts off, <clears throat> so why is it that all things work together for good to them who love God? For, because, whom he did foreknow. Now that's an important phrase. Whom, and this is my uh, emphasis here, not in the scripture, but whom he did foreknow. Is there a difference? Because most people read that, and when they talk about predestination and, and election, all they, they want to talk about what God foreknew. God, did, did God know you were going to be sitting in this chair Sunday morning, November the 3rd, 2024? Yeah, but that's what he knew, not who he knew. He knows what, he knows things, but he also knows somebody. See, if, if I say, who do you know at Grace Alive? So what am I asking you? Right, am I asking you what, what goes on here? Or am I asking you, who do you know? I'm asking you, and you notice the word there, and Galen pointed out this morning, every word is important. So whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to. So he, fore, he knew somebody before. He knew somebody before something. So now we need to talk about whom he did foreknow. So who means person, not event, not thing, for no. What, what, is, what is to know in Scripture? Go back to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. You know, here's that, that kind of rule of first mention again, which, you know, you can't, can't use it every time. It's not always true, but it's interesting in this case at least. Genesis 4, 1, and Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived. And bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So when we say Adam knew Eve his wife, do we mean that Adam up and said, nice to meet you, Eve. How are you today? Now I know you. Does that, does that way things get conceived? It's not the way they, they had a, they had a, not just a physical relationship, but an intimate relationship. So no in Scripture is a reference not just to, well, God knows what's going to happen, but it's also a reference to an intimate relationship, especially when you combine it with whom. It's, the verse doesn't say, for what he foreknew. It says, for whom he foreknew. Go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 25. Matthew chapter 1 
or 24 rather, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 24. Matthew 1, 24. Then Joseph, being raised from, the, from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Is that verse saying that Joseph had no idea that Mary even existed until Jesus Christ was born? Well, obviously not. He knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son. He didn't have an intimate relationship with her until after she brought forth her firstborn son, whom he did foreknow. It's about who. Go to Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians 4, that, that term to know or knew is used directly of God's relationship to his people. So Galatians chapter 4 and verse 8. Galatians 4 and verse 8. Paul says this, How be it, when ye knew not God, ye did service to them which, which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggar with elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Paul says, ye now are, now are known of God. So if you're a believer, if you are, if you look in verse 7, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, if a son then an heir of God through Christ. So if you're an heir of God through Christ, you're no more a servant, but you're a son. And in verse 9, you are known of God because you are his son. Does that mean that God didn't even know you existed before you were his son? It doesn't mean that. It means there was no intimate relationship. You now, that's what Paul's saying in the passage in verse 7, because, uh, uh, yeah, where, wherefore thou were a servant but a son, if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You've been made an heir of God through Christ. In verse 6, uh, he sent the spirit of his son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we have this intimate father-son relationship now, and we are now known of God. So when you say whom he did foreknow, we're talking about a relationship, a, a fore, foreknowing that somebody he knew had a relationship before. Go to John chapter 17. Well, who in the world would that be? Well, I think John 17 sort of um, gives us some insight into that. John 17 verse 24, this is... Jesus Christ, this is the true Lord's Prayer. This is the Lord praying to his Father, um, you know, bef before, uh, before his ascension. And in John chapter 17, uh, we read this, verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be, myth be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. When did the Father have a relationship with the Son? Bef thou lovest, is love one of those intimate relationships? It is. So Jesus Christ prays and he says, Father, I want those that you've given to me to be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. He Earlier in the passage, he says, glorify me. In fact, look in verse um, 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had in thee, when? Before the world was. And then over in verse 24, why did you have that glory before the world was? For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So, who did God foreknow? He foreknew Christ. So, so there, it's not, first of all, it's not what he knew, it's who he knew. Second of all, it's not who he came to know then, when Paul's writing Romans, it's who he foreknew. Before the world, before, not even, this is even, not before the world began, but before the foundation of the world. Before, before he laid the foundation, you can go back to Job and read about him 
uh, laying the foundation of the, the earth and all that kind of stuff. Before all of that, he knew Jesus Christ. So go back now to Romans 8. So with that in our mind, so why is it, why is it that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them are the called according to his purpose? Well, it's because whom he did foreknow. And who is that? The one whom he did foreknow. And then four things here about, about the person that he did foreknow, but then we're going to see in a minute as we close why that means something to us. Four things. For whom he did foreknow, verse 29, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He did predestinate um, to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, a son, we're not going to get into all that, but a son in Scripture is one that has the attributes and characteristics of the father. So you look at, you know, when you look at my son and you say, he's a chip off the old block. When you plant corn, you get corn. You know, that's, that's it. It's, you know, that has the attributes and characteristics of the father. Sometimes that's good. That's bad. But that's just the way it is. So the son has the attributes and characteristics of the father. And as Paul goes through this list, it's about Christ, but it's about his body too. We'll get to that. Go back to Luke chapter 22. So he did predestinate. Who is it? Who's, who's the one being in all human history that had a destiny that was laid out from before the foundation of the world, Christ. Luke 22, verse 22 says this, Truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. The Son of Man goeth as it was determined. He's called the Lamb of God slain from what? The foundation of the world. Go to Titus chapter 1. Look what Paul says about it. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Before the world began, before there were people, before there were angels, before there was anything, who did God promise? Who did God make a promise to about eternal life? His son, himself, because you know, we've looked at this in detail in the past, so we're not going to go off on a rabbit trail this morning. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They had, you know, Henry Culp used to call it an eternal life conference before the world began, before the foundation of the world. They got together and had this conference say, God, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, before God even created life, he promised eternal life. See, now that's a smart fellow right there. Before, before there's even life here, he promises eternal life. And each part of the Godhead in that eternal life conference determined what their role would be. The Father was the architect. He had the plan. He conceived the plan of redemption. Jesus Christ is the builder. He is the, the, the sacrifice for sin, for all mankind. He's the lamb slain from, for the foundation of the world. And the Holy Spirit is the master craftsman that puts that plan together, and he secures, being secured by that Holy Spirit that, that, that indwells us. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit each had a role to play in the plan of redemption, and they determined that plan before the world began. It was the destiny of Jesus Christ from that, can you call it a moment if it was before time began, I don't know. That's a good question. From, from when that decision was made, Father, Son, and Holy, we promise eternal life. How, how are we going to get eternal life? It's going to be vested in Jesus Christ. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit decided eternal life will dwell within one of us, and it will dwell within Christ, and he will pay the penalty for sin. And it is determined that that will be. And it didn't matter. We've studied this many times. It didn't matter if Israel killed him in vile disbelief or if Israel took him by faith and bound the sacrifice to the horns of the altar as the perfect lamb of God, which God provided. He's going to die for sin. And he did. 
whom he hath foreknown, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. We'll get into that a little bit more in just a minute. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, you can kind of keep a hand in Romans chapter 8 there, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 20. So he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. So what happened? Well, we'll get into that in a minute here. These things all go together, and it's hard to talk about one without talking about them all. So we'll try to talk about each one individually and then hopefully see how they really are all one package deal. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He, he before the world began, if it would be vested in a person in Jesus Christ. And he, he determined verse 10 of that same chapter, Ephesians 1, that in the dispensation, the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And, and as he's, when he raises him from the dead, that mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and he called him to take a seat right here at my right hand. You, you, son, you come. You come. You did the work. You did exactly what you were determined to do. You paid the penalty for sin, and now I am going to call you to the position that is rightfully yours. Sit right here beside the Father. And whom He called, them He also justified. Romans chapter one and verse four. When he called Jesus Christ to sit beside him. Romans 1 uh, verse 4 says this, and declared to be the son, well, look, look at verse um, 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and de declared to be the son of God with power. What, what power is that? According to the spirit of holiness by the what? resurrection from that he's declared to be the son of God. So he's justified. What does justified mean, first of all? Close. It means to be there. Keith said it. The, the, the guy in the back there always knows what he's talking about. It means, it's because he has to listen to all this. Um, declared to be righteous. What happened to Jesus Christ on the cross? What was he declared to be on the cross? Sin. He was made to be sin for us. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. And on that cross, he became the personification of sin, the, the, whole, the whole weight of God's wrath. God literally turned his back on his son. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And poured out his wrath upon him. I'm a worm and no man, despised of men. That's why. So on that cross, what is he? He's sin. He's the personification of sin. He's declared to be sin because he's paying for our sin. It's not his sin. It's your sin. It's my sin. It's the sin of all mankind placed on him there. But then what happened? God declared him to be his son. How? By raising him from the dead and sitting at his own right hand. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Galen mentioned this this morning in the first session in his study. Uh, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Verse uh, verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. How did he get to be the head of all principality and power? Verse 13, you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you his passes, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, having spoiled principalities and power, may I show them openly, triumphing over them in it. 
When did he triumph over them in it? How do, how did they know? How do they know he triumphed over them? Resurrection. Because the father said, son, come on, come on, come up, and you sit right here beside me. Would Jesus, would, would God Almighty ask a sinner to sit beside him on the right hand? No. So when he said, come on, son, sit right here, what's he doing to him? He's justifying him. He's declaring, even though he went to the cross and he became sin and he was made to be sin for all mankind, now I declare him to be my son with power. You want to see, see my power? Son, come on. Come from the dead. Come out of that grave. Ascend through the atmosphere. Ascend through the heavens, through the principalities and powers, through those fallen angels, and they can't touch you because you're my son, and you sit right here beside me. And, that, and, that, and that's when Satan knew, made a show of them openly. And he, as he goes up through the heavenly places, Satan's like, oh, crap. <laughs> I was afraid this was going to happen. He, he did. And, and he raised him up, not just above the earth, but above all heavens to fill all things. Predestinated, called, justified, and we just talked about it. Go to Philippians chapter 4, I'm sorry, chapter 2. Whom he also called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All those things that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8, go back there to Romans 8 now, every one of those things are things that he accomplished with Christ. He, he, he foreknew him before the world began. He predestinated him to pay the penalty for sin and to sit at his own right hand. He called him to take that position. He declared him to the universe to be just, righteous, even though he was made to be sin, that's my righteous son that sits at my right hand. And you know how you know that? Because I glorified him. Here he is at my right hand. And then the very next thing, Paul, the very, so think about all those things he did for, who did all those things? God did all those things. God did all, and they all are to fulfill his what? Purpose. All those things are to fulfill God's purpose, that he purposed in Christ Jesus when? Before the world began. And the very next thing Paul says in verse 31, What shall we then say to these things? What things? The all things in 28. The stuff we what, what, what about this? You know, he chose Christ, he called Christ, he sat on his right hand, he declared him righteous to the universe, he glorified him, whoop de doo How shall he not with him freely give us what? All, are you a part of his destiny now? Yes. Are you a part of his calling now? Yes. Are you a part of his justification now? Yes. Are you going to be part of his glorification? Yes. All those things that God did through Jesus Christ to fulfill his purpose, who gets them now? How shall, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And then he says this, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God. So who is God's elect? Before us. Christ was God's elect. Uh, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, he calls the, the Messiah mine elect. Titus chapter 1, he is the elect one of the Father. Elect in elect, uh, Christ was chosen before the world began. So if, no, if people can't lay anything to the charge of God's elect, Jesus Christ, and he's given you all things that he's given Christ, then what? It can't lay anything to your charge either. 
Who shall lay anything to charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. We sing that song, God sees my Savior, and then he sees me in the Beloved, accepted and free. See, that's how he makes intercession for us. He sits there at the right hand of the Father, and we're in him, and the Father looks at him, and he sees my Savior, Jesus Christ, predestinated, called, justified, glorified, and in him seek me, in the beloved, accepted, and free. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as a sheep for the slaughter. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is where? And where are you? All the things that any other creature, what is everything creature, what is it? Back to the beginning of this study. Vain. It's all vanity. It's all vanity. But what about the things that God did in verse 28, 29, and 30? That's after his own purpose and will. So, and the vain stuff that creation does to you undo the purposeful stuff that God did? Never. And the first thing he names is, I am persuaded that neither death. What's the worst thing, that's the most, when, when, when Solomon talks about vanity, he says, one generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, and it's all vanity. So what's the, the, the biggest personification, the biggest indication of vanity? You die. And no matter what you accomplished in this life, ouch, you're dead. Vanity, vanity. You're dead. You're gone. You're gone. It's vanity. It's all vanity. So the first thing, can, can death, the absolute ex most extreme thing that vanity can do to you is kill you, can that undo the purposeful things that God did for you in Christ Jesus? It can't. It can't. So when you know, the tornado hits the trailer park, or when you get the diagnosis of cancer, or when some terrible things happen in your life, the, the, the goal is not to say, well, this thing, God's going to use it for good somehow. The goal is to say, in spite of this thing, and this thing that is the, the, the world and the devil attacking and doing what they can, and the curse that's on this world, despite all of that, you know what? I'm predestinated, I'm called, I'm justified, I'm glorified, and God knows me, his son Jesus Christ. And the world can do whatever it wants to me, and it can't touch that. That's how all things work together for good. Not the vain stuff that happens, but the things God does for his purpose. Those are always working for your good. Always, always, always. And no matter how much this world works to defeat that, it cannot. Why? Because we are more than conquerors over all that stuff through him that loved us. So the all things of, of Romans chapter 8 are... Those things that God has, and they are, he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. They're exactly what he was planning to do for the body of Christ and get us in Christ. Other things, that's all vanity. But these things overcome the vanity of the world. Let's bow our hearts down a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus for the opportunity of looking at your word and Sunday together this morning. We thank you that although the world can throw all its vanity at us, it cannot undo God's purpose, which you purposed in Christ Jesus before the world began. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.